Thank you, Clay. Um, so just one minor uh, comment. The, the next session that's going to be done on uh, dehydration is going to be on molecular sieve dehydration. And so uh, a slightly different topic, but we're still going to focus on dehy. And so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing I need to, need to do is cover the legal bit. Um, so basically this tells you that everything that is going to be shared in this webinar is of uh, general nature and that we make no warranties express or implied or statutory with respect to the information in this webinar, including without limitation any warranties of merchant, merchantability or fitness for a particular purpose. All right. Um, so we will have no liability to any party for any ordinary special or consequential damages or losses which might arise directly or indirectly by reason of users' use of this information shared in this webinar. All right, now we got that out of the way. Uh, just a really quick review. Um, this is what your window should look like. If you hover your mouse at the top of your screen, you'll, you'll find your participant in the chat buttons. Um, when you pull, when you click on those, um, this will pull up the participant box and will also allow you to submit your questions to my good friend Stu um, via chat. So that is a little bit of how to find things in WebEx. And so um, a brief introduction. Uh, I'm Kendra Snow McGregor. I have a bachelor's and master's degree uh, from the Colorado School of Mines in Chemical Engineering. I am the Discipline Manager for Oil and Gas Processing, and I'm a Senior Instructor and Technical Consultant. Um, I have over 23 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. Prior to joining PetroSkills John M. Campbell, I worked for two significant EPC companies, and I've done various projects from major international oil and gas companies to very small shale play MLPs. Um, I've published eight papers at various international conferences, I've provided multiple tips of the months, and I hold two technology patents. Um, I'm an experienced trainer. Uh, my specialties are oil and gas processing and operator training. I also serve on the GPSA Board of Directors and the Editorial Review Board for the GPSA Engineering Data Book. Um, I've been with the company since 2008, and I've been a full-time instructor with uh, PetroSkills John M. Kemble since 2011. And so with that, I would like to pass it over to Stu, so Stu can provide his introduction. Hey, thanks, Kendra. Um, uh, my background is mechanical engineering, um, and I'll find myself, obviously you can hear there's a bit of an accent in there, uh, originally from Australia where I went to university, and holding around about 20 years of experience. Uh, lots of different projects from field gas gathering to major project implementations, uh, here in the US, uh, in the UAE, Australia, Kazakhstan, and, and some projects in West Africa are some of my uh, projects. And that picture there um, of the, uh, the large vessel, the second one, uh, that's actually a TEG contactor that was in New Mexico just on that, that particular project. You can see the next picture along, there's uh, some of us in a, that's actually a pipeline design course in Katy, Texas. Um, I've been training with uh, PetroSkills John M. Campbell since 2009. I've held various positions uh, from uh, Technical Director of Facilities Engineering. Currently, I'm just a contract instructor and technical advisor, um, specializing in rotating equipment, static equipment, and uh, plant operations. I really appreciate bridging the gap between mechanical engineering and process engineering. And so, that's where I find myself mostly these days, but happy to be here and try and answer as many questions as I can. So take it away, Kendra. Excellent, thank you, Stu. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving right along, uh, as far as our objectives, what we're gonna talk about today is why do we dehydrate natural gas and how does TEG work? And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to explain why we need to dehydrate the natural gas, all right? Um, once we understand that, we're going to take a quick look at the TEG dehydration process, and we'll take a look at the various components. And then what I really want to focus on are the key uh, operating performance parameters, because if these per performance parameters are being met, then you can easily achieve your water, your dry gas water dew point. All right, so why do we dehydrate our natural gas? Um, 
I guess before I begin, let me take a step back. Um, in case of, for folks who are not aware, any time I take production out of a reservoir, it is always in communication with aquifers down below the surface. And so when these fluids come to the surface, they're always saturated in water. And so there's always water present. And as a result of having water present in our system, this can cause us uh, multiple problems. Um, for one thing, when I have a lot of free water in my gathering system, this can cause me um, a lot of uh, hydraulic problems. And so essentially this will reduce my pipeline capacity because now I have a whole bunch of water that's in that pipeline that's really not a product for me. It, it's you know something that I need to deal with. Um, but the other bigger issue is that this can cause me um, some serious flow regime concerns. So I can get into a, a situation where I see significant slugs of water coming into my plant and as a result, I need these uh, slug catchers, as you can see in this diagram here. This is actually a photo. Um, so I need to build these really large vessels in order to handle the large amounts of volume that are coming in as a result of this slug flow regime. Um, in addition, anytime I have free water in my system, I have an issue with increased corrosion. And so uh, free water is a problem. Um, in addition, another really significant problem in having water in my natural gas streams is that this water can cause hydrates. And um, you can see this picture here. This is from my friends at Petrobras, all right? And so you can see there's the ocean right there. We're on an offshore platform. And um, essentially what a hydrate is, is uh, when I get specific components, let's say methane, hydrogen sulfide, propane, isobutane, and it gets in, uh, mixed in with water, it can form ice. It's literally ice made out of natural gas and water. And, um, and it forms at very ambient conditions, all right? And so what was happening in this picture here, uh, they were starting up the gathering system and they had just hydro tested uh, the subsea pipeline. And so they had cleared the water, but they didn't do a sufficient job with clearing the water. And as a result, when they started production, they could hear the hydrates forming. And so they made the decision to push the hydrates out of this uh, pig receiver here. Now, I, ne I need to note that this, what you're looking at right here is an exceptionally hazardous uh, operation. Um, because if you get a very high pressure differential, let's say I have high pressure here, and you can see here we're at atmosphere, um, I can create a bullet of that ginormous chunk of ice and it will blow through valves, elbows, your pig uh, receiver door and um, easily kill somebody. Um, so that, that, this is a very dangerous operation. Um, but at any rate, once we get the hydrate plug out, that hydrate starts to disassociate immediately. And so that means the ice starts to melt and now my natural gas starts flowing off or whatever components were um, built in this hydrate. And so in this example here, they actually had H2S, a small amount of H2S in their gas stream. And H2S is a very strong hydrate former. And so that made this uh, operation even more hazardous because the H2S concentrates up in that hydrate crystal. And now when they bring it onto the, the platform, now we're starting to re release H2S into the atmosphere, which is an exceptionally toxic gas. And so anytime you're working with hydrates or trying to uh, unplug a hydrate, please be exceptionally careful and, and do a hazard review before you do anything. Um, because this is one of the areas where we have a lot of incidents and a lot of people can get hurt. Um, so hydrates are a big problem for us. Now, the other issue with hydrates is that they can lead to corrosion. And you can see this picture here. Um, this happens to be the El Paso dry, dry gas pipeline. This is a transmission line um, that's selling natural gas. And you can see, I wanna point out the size of this fireball. These structures that you can see right here are 80 foot tall uh, bridge support structures. And so that gives you an idea of the intensity of the flame and the size of that fireball. Um, now, unfortunately, um, in the past, we used to say, okay, look, it's a dry gas pipeline. There's no way we could get water in that pipeline because we've dried it. Um, and as a result, 70% of the distribution gas pipelines in the world 
are constructed non-pickable. And so that means I can't run an object, an object down that pipeline to flush out any liquids that may have started gathering in the low spots. After this incident, all pipelines must be pickable, and that's a very effective way in mitigating corrosion because you know that you know on some uh, you know time like schedule, you you'll be able to run a pig through that line to ensure that you're not building up liquids. Um, so, anyways, this incident happened in in 2000, and uh, unfortunately, it was a campsite where 12 people were camping in the middle of uh, the great outdoors, and it was their campsite that ignited the fire. And so you can see this is a picture of what that pipeline rupture looked like. Um, so this was a significant, significant failure, and essentially it was bottom line corrosion that that failed the pipeline. And so uh, the, the reason why I'm kind of spending a fair amount of time on this is because if I'm using a TEG dehydration plant to ensure that my gas is dry going into a transmission line, that actually is a pretty critical um, service. And so even a 2% plant unreliability could let, lend itself to having issues or possible corrosion in the pipeline. And so if I have contaminate, contaminated glycol with say CO2, maybe H2S, you know, maybe my produced water from that uh, glycol train had a little bit of salt in it, um, any kind of brine, that's really going to exacerbate the corrosion that can occur in these systems. Um, in addition, I can also wake up bacteria that's in that pipeline as a result of having these liquids in there now. And now I could be subject to microbial influenced corrosion. And so uh, what do you do? Well, the good practice is be sure that you understand that your plant is meeting your dry gas spec. And so, you know, maybe consider having multiple moisture analyzers and alarms. Um, and then if you do see your gas going off spec and the pipeline company isn't going to shut you in, good practice is to start injecting corrosion inhibitors and um, uh, biocides. So you know that any liquids in there, it's still going to be safe. Now, the other problem with free water is notice I can get fouling. And this isn't necessarily the greatest picture, but um, what happens when I start getting corrosion in a carbon steel pipeline is I'm going to start getting fines of iron sulfide carbonate, uh, carbonates, pardon me. And these fines can be very difficult to deal with. And then once they get into my plant, I have a hard time filtering them out. And these fines love to cause my TEG to foam, all right? And so, those are the primary reasons that we dehydrate our natural gas. And so let's talk about now, well, you know, what is the typical pipeline water content specification? And so I'm just talking about water, right? And so I can specify this either as a water content or a water dew point. And this specification depends on my ambient condition, i.e., how cold is it going to get outside in the location where this pipeline is going to be. And so some typical um, specifications, you can see here, US Gulf Coast or the Mekon area, seven pounds per million standard cubic feet. In North America, we, us we usually specify it as a content. Um, in the northern states, so now I'm, I know I'm gonna be cold, um, three to four pounds per million. Now, if I look at Europe, all right, I see Europe's roughly minus 10 degrees C water dew point at 70 bar. And if you were to do the conversion, um, that's essentially the same water spec. That's the same concentration as three to four pounds per million. Um, when I look at the Middle East, we know that we're very hot in the Middle East, so I don't need to get my gas really dry because it'll never get that cold. And so my Middle East water content is less than zero C at roughly 69 kPa, and that's roughly equivalent to seven pounds per million. All right, and so let's take a look now, just briefly, at water content of sweet, lean, natural gas. All right, so this right here is the nitty gritty. All right, this is how I can figure out how much water I have coming in my stream. And so let's just look at an example. I'm gonna run with this example through the rest of the presentation. All right, so I'm going to say I have an inlet gas and my inlet gas temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit at 1,000 PSA. 
And so notice this chart down here, my x-axis, water dew point, degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so that's my inlet gas temperature. And then you can see here is my water content of sweet natural gas, and this is a mass, pound mass of water per million standard cubic feet. When you look inside of the chart, you see these are lines of pressure, all right? And so if I know my inlet pressure, I know my inlet temperature, I can find what is the saturated natural gas uh, water content. So let's continue on with this example. I come down and I find a, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you can see I just highlighted it, and 1,000 PSI. I draw my line straight up to intersect. I draw the line over and I say, okay, I know at that condition, my saturated gas has 60 pounds per million standard cubic feet. All right, good stuff. Now, let's run an example dry gas spec. Let's say I need to meet a dry gas spec of 10 degrees Fahrenheit at 1,000 pounds, all right? Um, and so I come down, I find 10 degrees Fahrenheit, draw my line up to my pressure, draw the line straight over, and I say, okay, I know that I need to meet a three pound per million water dew point spec, all right? And we just saw that that's a very common specification for the Northern Rockies. And so let's say, um, I wanted to know how much water I need to remove in terms of a percent or water removal efficiency for this given TEG dehydration application. And so you can see, I simply take 60 pounds per million minus three, three pounds per million, so in minus out, divided by the total, and I see I need 95 weight percent water removal efficiency, okay? and so. Um, they, we have these charts in SI units as well. Uh, given I only have an hour, I didn't feel that I had time to run it in SI. Uh, you guys, if you want this chart in SI units, uh, shoot me or, or do a note and, and we'll send that out to you, okay? All right, so um, let's take a quick look, all right? Um, what happens? What happens? Let's say I, I need to put in inlet gas compression to my plant. And now let's say, instead of having a 100 degree Fahrenheit gas inlet temperature, I, my gas temperature goes up to 110, all right? And so you can see here, I come and I find 110, draw that line straight up, and notice now my water coming in is 80 pounds per million. And when that happens, ouch, 33% increase, all right? So you guys, if you're taking notes, I would encourage you that you do um, a good rule of thumb so rule of thumb, for every, every 5C or 9F increase, your water content is going to go up 25 to 30, 30%, roughly, all right? So that's a big deal. And if, I, if I'm trying to run a plant to remove the water, a 33% increase to the inlet is significant. And I know straight up, I'm going to need to do something to my plant operations to ensure that when that uh, temperature increase happens, that I adjust the plant accordingly to ensure I'm still meeting that dry gas dew point spec. All right, so with that said, let's take a look at our TEG dehydration components and process flow. All right, and so when I go through this flow sheet, I'm going to do this at a pretty high level because after we get done talking about the flow sheet, we're going to take a look at all the various pieces of equipment and talk about their key performance parameters, okay? And so I'm gonna start on uh, the side, let me get my highlighter going, highlighter. Um, I'm gonna start on the inlet. So you can see here is my wet process gas coming in. And the first thing I do is I send my process gas through an inlet separator. And really what I'm trying to do is remove any free liquids like liquid hydrocarbons, produce water, uh, drilling fluids, um, any type of contaminant that might be in that natural gas stream. So I'm hoping to drop that out in the inlet separator and then my gas flows on into my glycol contactor, okay? And you can see this contactor is filled with either trays or packing. And so that's a mass transfer uh, device where I can flow a liquid down the column and my gas rises up through the column and they um, contact one another and with effective mixing, I hope. And so let's follow the gas stream. The gas flows up. And as the gas flows up, I'll change my color. I'll make TEG green. 
uh, my lean TG enters the top of the column and is flowing down. By the time it comes out the bottom, it has absorbed all the water out of that natural gas. Okay. And so now when my gas leaves that contactor here, my gas is dry. And notice I have an outlet scrubber and my dry gas goes out. All right. And so a couple of things. First thing, this is the absorption section. All right. And so this happens at high pressure, low temperature. All right, generally I'm at pipeline pressure. So typically I'm about a thousand pounds. Um, a good rule of thumb, I will never dehydrate my gas below 140 PSIA or 400 KPA. And the reason why is because if you go back and look at that water chart, my natural gas holds a lot more water um, at lower pressure. And so it's just not economical for me to uh, build that plant that way. And so just remember the adsorption is high pressure, low temperature. In addition, my water removal efficiency, I will expect to remove 90 to 95% of all the water in the inlet gas, all right? So TEG is an exceptionally effective um, a, a, like adsorption agent, all right? This happens under physical adsorption. And you can kind of think of it as a thirsty sponge. It will just like suck up all that water very, very effectively. It's, it works great. All right, so that's a good rule of thumb, 90 to 95% H2O water removal efficiency. Um, another rule of thumb here is that my lean TEG is typically 99 weight percent. All right. And so that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of the adsorption. I will go into more details here in a moment. But let's take all the ink off the slide. And now let's talk about what do I do to regenerate my glycol, all right? Now notice here is my rich glycol. And it flows from my contactor. And so the equipment that we're going to be looking at is all the uh, regeneration equipment. And so as it flows through the contactor, notice it goes through this little uh, heating coil on the top of my stripping still. Now that heating coil is intended to cool off the vapors that's leaving my stripping still where I'm boiling off. I'm literally just boiling the water out of the TEG. And so I don't want that temperature to get too hot because then I'll get excessive TEG losses. So I, I want to be sure that that's open and running. And then notice I come down into this flash drum. All right. Now this flash drum is here because there is some mutual solubility between my lighter hydrocarbons like methane and ethane and TEG. And so I want to be able to flash those off. More often than not, I'll burn those in my fuel gas system because I want to keep those hydrocarbons from exiting the still because the still over here, you can see, uh, typically, it, well, it depends on what's in your gas, but more often than not, uh, will go to the atmosphere unless if I have uh, BTEX, so benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, xylene. Um, I kind of feel like that's, if I have time to talk about that in detail at the end of this session, um, I will, uh, but I'm going to let that go for right now. All right. So anyways, that is the purpose of my um, flash drum here. And notice the other thing that I have is this is actually a three-phase separator. All right. And if I have a really rich gas in hydrocarbons, all right, or you can call it a wet gas in terms of uh, hydrocarbon content, um, I want to be sure I have a way to get liquid hydrocarbons out of my TEG unit because this is a closed system. And so if I don't have the ability to drain them out somewhere, then they get built, they will start building up and start really causing me some um, operational problems. And so having a three-phase separator as a flash drum is very handy. Um, not all plants have three-phase separators, but uh, many do. And so you can see now my rich uh, TEG flows through my filtration here, all right? So these are carbon filters and some sock filters. So I'm trying to remove um, organic contaminants and you know any particulates. And then I go through my lean rich exchanger here. And all I'm doing with that heat exchanger is I have this really hot lean TEG that I need to cool off. And so I'm using this hot lean TEG to preheat my rich lean TEG so I reduce the size of my reboiler here. All right, that's all I'm doing, a little bit of heat integration. And so once the uh, rich TEG flows to the still column, 
it flows down this packing. You can see I have a hot oil tube here. Oftentimes it's a direct fired heater. And all I'm doing is I have this bath of TEG and I'm boiling it. And so I'm boiling out all the water that the TEG just picked up from my natural gas. And so that water vapor goes out the top. And then notice on this reboiler, I have an, an overflow weir and a secondary stripper. Um, this secondary stripper, uh, often referred to as a stall stripper back in the day when there was still a patent on it, um, but the secondary stripper is used to increase the leanness of my lean TEG um, if I need to, all right? And so we'll take a look at, at why I may need to do that here in a moment. And so you can see here's some stripping gas Generally, we use our dry natural gas, all right? So we'll just put a little stripping gas through here, bubble it through a packed section, and then what happens is when that natural gas flows cross current against the lean, hot lean TEG, the water in the TEG looks up in that vapor space and it recognizes it's no longer in equilibrium uh, with that vapor space, and so it drives more water out of the TEG so I get a much leaner TEG. And so from there, notice I have a lean TEG booster pump. Um, I go into my high pressure pump, and then I go through a lean TEG cooler. Notice I am controlling the temperature. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But as far as this equipment here, this is on my regen equipment, all right? And so all of this occurs at high temperature and low pressure, okay? And the other thing I should note that is that if I had a reboiler operating at atmospheric pressure, the best I might be able to achieve in terms of lean TG would be 98.5 weight percent, and that would be at sea level, all right? And so if I need a TG concentration leaner than that, then I need to start using that stripping gas. All right, so now that we have a handle on the process, let's take a fast look at my um, pieces of equipment, all right? So the first thing is this inlet separator, all right? And this really is a critical piece of equipment because remember, my TEG is the, is the closed loop system, and more often than not, my poor inlet separation causes foaming and fouling, all right? And so really what I would prefer is having um, a good inlet separ a separator followed by a coalescing filter separator. Um, it really is that critical to try to keep anything from flowing into your TEG unit and contaminating that TEG. Now, my adsorber is a counter current content, uh, contact of natural gas and my liquid TEG. And remember, this is happening under physical absorption. And so really that, that uh, it, my TEG is really just really thirsty. So it's a very effective dehydrating agent. Um, but there is a minimum lean TEG concentration that's required, and my inlet temperature is important. Um, I could use either structured packing or bubble cap trays. And if I'm using structured packing, um, here's the thing. If I have a contactor with structured packing, that results in a much smaller diameter than, say, a bubble cap tray. And the reason why is because I don't need the room for the downcomers um, to go from tray to tray. And so, uh, I can cram a lot of gas through that structured packing, but I also need to be sure that that mist extractor is designed to handle the, you know, whatever gas I'm going to throw at it. Um, the bigger issue with structured packing is that if I need to run that contactor at turndown conditions, mm, you're going to have a really hard time doing that because structured packing has a pretty limited uh, turndown capacity. So some pros and some cons. Uh, as far as the bubble cap tray, boy, that that guy works. It has incredible turn down capacity, um, but they're also more expensive and I need a much larger diameter. So some pros and cons. All right, so now um, notice here's my regenerator. All right, this is where I'm gonna uh, regenerate my TEG and you can see here's my maximum temperature. All right, so my ma max temperature is 400 Fahrenheit or 204 degrees C. My degradation temperature, all right, the temperature that starts uh, thermally breaking down my solvent is 403 or 206 Celsius. And so um, the reality is, you know, if your bath temperature is 400 F, you know that that skin surface on whatever heating element you're using is significantly greater. You know for a fact you're degrading, you're cooking your TEG um, over the period of time. 
Um, so you just need to be cognizant of that. And, you know, the lower temperature you can run and still meet your lean TG uh, concentration, the better. Um, we already talked about the stripping gas, so it essentially lowers the effective pressure um, in the still. And so uh, anything, like mainly it's water and BTEX that's going to leave that column still. If I have BTEX in that stream, then that needs to go uh, usually to an incinerator. Um, I might try to burn it in my fire tube. Um, but because those are, the B and the, the E are carcinogens, the T and the X are, are significant uh, irritants to your lungs. All right, so that's the deal with the regenerator. Let's take a quick look at the lean rich exchanger. Um, these typically are double pipe and pipe, or maybe it's a welded plate and frame. Welded plate and frame are very um, common. And remember, all I'm doing is conserving the heat um, that I need to put into that reboiler. So it's just a small amount of heat integration. All right, now here is my lean TEG cooler, all right? And this guy is important. And so notice we're looking at the temperature here, right? And so I want to be sure that my lean TEG temperature is 9 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 to 10 degrees C above my feed inlet gas temperature. And so um, the primary reason why, I'm going to get kind of geeky on you here. I'm going to draw a phase envelope. All right, so here's my temperature. Here's my pressure. And let's say here is my gas. And what's happening, this is my dew point line. Anytime my gas goes into anywhere, um, unless if I do something to like cool it or condense liquids out, um, but anytime I leave the separator, that gas is always at its dew point. And so that means any, notice this is temperature. If I start decreasing my temperature, I go into the two phase region and now I have liquid hydrocarbons dropping out in my contactor because my TEG was too cold, all right? So that's a bad deal. That will start causing you operating problems almost immediately. And so you wanna be sure, you, you need the lean TEG to be as cool as possible because you're gonna get better performance in terms of vapor liquid equilibrium. But you also need to be sure that you're keeping it above the feed gas temperature so that you do not condense out any liquid hydrocarbons into your, into your uh, unit. Um, notice here's my flash drum. And so uh, I talked that you know, the primary purpose is to degas some of the co-absorbed methane. And typical pressure ranges on this guy might be 44 to 102 PSIA or 300 to 700 kPa. Um, generally, what we do is we'll, we'll design the flash drum to be able to get into the fuel gas system um, because we prefer using that gas as a fuel rather than sending it off to flare. All right. Um, as far as uh, my lean TG circulation pumps, uh, notice these are typically uh, reciprocating multiplex type if I have power on site. All right, if I have no power, let's say I'm out in the field somewhere, I don't have any power at site, I can use what's called a Kim Ray pump. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with that, get on YouTube. There's some pretty cool videos that shows you how this, uh, how this pump works. Um, but as far as those pumps, it's really good to have excess capacity, all right? And when we start looking at, at the key performance parameters, I'm going to be talking about my typical TEG circulation ratios in terms of mass of TEG per mass of water. And so typical mass TEG, so a pound of TEG per pound of water is 15 to 40, all right? And for new facilities, uh, generally we see 20 to 30 um, to be more standard, okay? All right, so gives you an idea of, you know, what those circulation rates look like. Um, oh, the other thing I didn't mention, uh, this booster pump right here, uh, depending on what type of pump I'm using, I may need a, to have a booster pump to provide uh, sufficient net positive suction head available for the high pressure pump. So that, that's the only purpose, that little guy. All right, the last thing is my filters. Um, the carbon beds are used to remove my heavy, heavy hydrocarbons, my de degradation products. When I degrade TEG in my reboiler, it forms organic acids. And so it's really important that I'm able to maintain and keep those acids out of my system because that can cause my TEG to start going corrosive. And lastly, 
we have our outlet scrubber, all right? Many plants do not have this outlet scrubber. Um, if I have a field unit sitting out at a well site, I'm not gonna have that, likely will not have that outlet scrubber. Um, if I'm in a big in, you know, central processing facility, then I will. Um, it, it's best practice to have one because you wanna keep that TEG out of where this gas is going, all right? Because once that TEG is out and gone, it's gone. And it's gonna cause either you a problem somewhere else or someone else a problem. Uh, so uh, you just try to try to keep the TEG within the system. Um, good mist extraction is necessary, and so you know take a hard look at how that units you know what type of mist extractor you're using, and uh, TEG is typically recycled. And the reason why we do that is because TEG is very expensive. It's an expensive solvent to buy. I want to minimize my operating cost, and so you know if I can recover it, I'm going to reuse it. Um, Hopefully it's not in uh, too poor of a condition. All right, so that was a very fast overview of what my TEG uh, process looks like. Now I wanna talk about the key performance parameters because you guys, this, these are the important things that you need to keep an eye on if you're running one of these units. And so the first one is lean TEG leanness. All right, and so I have a quote from our friend Stu Watson. You cannot dry yourself with a wet towel. Stu Watson, PetroSkills instructor. And that is absolutely true. And that is also true for lean TEG. And so essentially, if my lean TEG isn't dry enough, I could circulate that solvent around to infinity and never meet my dry gas spec. It just, I, I can't get there. So let's take a look at, uh, how I figure this out. Now notice, I ha I'm showing two figures here, and at the bottom x-axis, this is my contactor temperature. And my y-axis is my equilibrium dry gas dew point that has been in equilibrium with a TEG of various concentrations. All right, so essentially, uh, notice I have 97 weight percent here, 99.9 .9 weight percent here. So essentially what we do is we measure this data in a laboratory. So we'll make gas samples, we'll make our TEG samples, and you know, we'll run different temperatures, and then we'll measure, well, what is that water dew point at that laboratory condition that has had days to come to equilibrium, all right? Um, and so essentially what happens in our operating units is we don't, we don't get to equilibrium. Um, so let's talk about a contactor that has an inlet gas of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees C. So let's take a look at how I read this thing. So notice I draw my contactor temperature and then I find my equilibrium dew point. And so let's work the example that we have, which was 10, my dry gas spec was 10 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 12.2 degrees C. And so I find that dry gas condition. So here's 10F, there's minus 12.2. I draw my line straight across and that tells me if, if, I could get to equilibrium, I would only need 99.0 weight percent TEG. All right, but here's the deal. We never, we will never reach equilibrium in our field units. It just doesn't happen. We will approach equilibrium, and a good rule of thumb is that our typical approach temperature is actually nine to 18 degrees Fahrenheit or five to 10 C higher, all right? So my actual dry gas dew point leaving that contactor is 9 to 18 Fahrenheit higher. All right, so if I didn't do anything, I would never meet my gas spec, right? Because I'm not gonna get to equilibrium. So what we do is we say, look, I'm going to assume an approach temperature for my operation, all right? And in this case, um, I am going to assume that I have an approach temperature of um, 14 Fahrenheit, all right? So I'm just gonna say 14 Fahrenheit, or 7.8 degrees C. I'm just being, you know, random, kind of middle of the road, 14 Fahrenheit. So when I make that assumption, notice I'd find my, um, if I take a 10 degree dew point, I minus 14 Fahrenheit, so that gives me minus four. I draw my line straight over. So all I do is I make my lean TEG, my minimum lean TEG required, much leaner. So I know for a fact that when I have that 
actual dew point approach of five to or nine to eighteen degrees Fahrenheit, then I'm still going to be on my dry gas spec. All right. And so that's why we always make an adjustment for that approach to equilibrium. And we always subtract that off of the dry gas specification. Okay. So now let's take a look at what happens when my inlet gas temperature increases. So again, let's go to 110 uh, Fahrenheit. And notice when we increase the gas temperature for the same dry gas condition, now my lean, my required lean TEG needs to be 99.6 weight percent, not 99.5. And if I was still trying to run with the 99.5 weight percent, percent, I'm not going to meet my dry gas spec. All right. And so from my perspective, your minimum lean TEG concentration required is step one. That's, that's the, if you're not, if you're not meeting the minimum, then your unit just isn't going to work. I don't care how much you're circulating around. All right, so that's, that's number one. All right, so the second key performance parameter is my adequate reboiler temperature and stripping gas. And so essentially, if I don't have adequate reboiler temperature or adequate stripping gas, then I'm not going to meet my minimum, my minimum lean TEG concentration, all right? I'm still going to have a wet towel, and I'm not going to meet my gas specification, my dry gas spec. So let's take a look at some of the details, all right? So I'm showing a reboiler here. Notice this is a direct fired heater. Uh, again, degradation temperature 206C or 403F, so you don't want to get too hot. Um, if I'm running at ambient conditions, I might get 98.5 to 98.9 weight percent. Depends on what plant elevation I have, all right? So what's my local uh, pressure? Um, if I need a concentration above this, then I need the stripping gas. And so let's take a look at my stripping gas figure. Notice this is stripping gas standard cubic meters per cubic meter TEG. And this is standard cubic feet per gallon. All right, that's, that's where I find my stripping gas rate. Notice my y-axis is my lean TEG weight percent. And then you can see I have all these curves on the inside of this figure for, let's take a look at the first one, N equals 2 uh, temperature 204C or 400F. All right, so all these curves in here are for this stripping column, all right? And so that N, N here is the number of theoretical stages. Right there, all right? Um, so let's do an example. Let's say I have a, a, a packed bed and I happen to know I have one theoretical stage and my temperature I'm running at is 204C or 400F, all right? So I highlight, the, highlight that line we decided that we needed 99.5 lean weight percent TEG. So I draw my line straight across where those two intersect. That tells me what my stripping gas rate is in both units, all right? Now, the other thing um, that we recognize is that we know that we're going to have um, a, a temperature that's hotter, you know, my heat transfer um, surface is going to have a much higher temperature than my degradation temperature, and so the way we mitigate that is we simply um, design the unit to have a given uh, flux rate, all right, so maximum flux, flux rate. All right, so number three, uh, the last thing, not the last, one of the last, I need to be worried about my sufficient TEG circulation rate, all right, and so essentially, if you do not have sufficient TEG circulation rate, then you do not have enough buckets to remove the water. All right, and I got that from Stu Watson from uh, the operator training course that he teaches for uh, Mark West, now Marathon Petroleum. Okay, so let's, let's see, what does that look like? How do I know how many buckets I need? Um, the first, in order to figure out the buckets, I really need to know how much water I'm removing. And so you saw from that water chart, I can figure out how much water you know, I need to remove in pounds per million standard cubic feet. I multiply that by my gas rate, bam, I got it. All right, so that's how I calculate my, my water removal. Now notice what I'm looking at here is I have a chart that shows me my mass lean TEG solution divided by my mass water absorbed. And notice here's my fraction water removed. And I have a different chart depending on how tall my TEG contactor is, all right? So this is the contactor. 
And so notice in this example, I have six trays or 1.5 um, theoretical stages. Now, for our example, we knew we needed 95% water removal, right? And we know we need 99.5 weight percent lean TEG. So I draw the line over and I go down, I go, oh, geez, all right, 60, right? I need 60 mass or 60 pounds of TEG for every pound of water I need to remove. Um, that's not within the realm of our typical operations, because remember the maximum is generally 40. So you look at that and go, okay, well, that's, that is outside the bounds of what we'd normally do. The other thing I want to point out is notice when we start moving out at the end of these curves here, they become nearly horizontal, all right? And so essentially what that does is as you start increasing your circulation rate, you're not getting any additional water removal capacity um, because that curve is essentially flat, all right? So living out there is not a good place to, to put in a new plant, all right? Um, so let's take a look at uh, a taller contactor. So now I have eight trays. So now I find my 95% fraction water removed. I come down, you know, find the 99.5 weight percent TG, come down, I find 30. And I go, okay, that looks good. That looks pretty good. I'm, you know, within the reasonable range. But now notice my contactor's gotten taller. And so the taller my contactor, the more capital cost I have inside this plant because it's that high pressure contactor that has a large diameter because it has to take all that gas rate um, so large uh, metal wall thicknesses, so all the money is being spent here, um, but I have a much lower circulation rate. All right, let's look at an even taller contactor. Notice 10 trays, so a theoretical, uh, 2.5 theoretical stages, and you can see now I'm down to 20. Now, if I was to, if I was looking at my plant, I would hope, I would hope that I would be somewhere in this region. I hope that my process operations is somewhere here. And the reason why is because notice when I'm down on the nose of this curve, let's say my temperature increased and now my inlet gas temperature increased and now let's say I need to achieve 96% water removal rate, not 95. We know that our lean TG concentrations can have to go up. But just for talking purposes, you can see if I have the capability of increasing my circulation rate, then I can still achieve my dry gas dew point spec. And so having a plant that's somewhere on the end of that nose of that curve is really, you know, the sweet spot where you want to be. All right. Alrighty. So that is having enough buckets. Uh, number four, effective inlet separation. All right. Now remember, this is a closed loop system. And so this is a quote from John M. Campbell Sr., who is the founder of John M. Campbell. Um, you cannot afford the dehydration unit if you cannot afford to provide an effective separator on the gas inlet. And that, that really is true. Um, you can see some pictures here of what a heavily fouled TEG unit looks like. And so um, essentially ineffective separation is the source for most operating problems. Um, and so the better job I can do in the front end, the easier it is going to be for me to run my plant. Um, so just remember, those, those units are closed systems. So if I get a really heavy hydrocarbon, let's say compressor lube oil that gets into my uh, TEG, it's going to stay in that TEG and start causing me significant operating problems. It can start thermally degrading in that reboiler because we're running at really hot temperatures. And so the only way I can get this out is I either need to remove it by mechanical filtration um, in the case of uh, corrosion fines, right? or uh, carbon filtration in the case of the lube oil, or I need to start blowing down my TEG and making up with fresh. That's a bad deal because TEG is very expensive. So it's better to keep it out in the first place. Um, the other thing I need to worry about, you know, I already, we saw that picture of the corrosion fine. So that's gonna really aggravate my TEG foaming. And TEG foaming looks like this, all right? So imagine you have your you know, 30 foot tall TEG contactor sitting out in the field and it's full of that foam. Is it going to break? No, it goes right out the top and down the pipeline. Um, and so that's why foaming is, is really, really bad. It makes your uh, process operations exceptionally difficult. And really the only way you can get out of it is by running at reduced gas rates. Reduced gas rates equals reduced production, which 
equals very unhappy plant managers. Um, so, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, the other thing, salts and produced water equals reboiler fire tube failures, and so that's that's not a good deal. Remember, if I have any briny produced water, that salt will go into the TEG. It finds my reboiler surface tube. It, the water boils off, the salts stay there, and now I have a beautiful place for corrosion. Um, and again, my heavy hydrocarbons, they will cause foaming and could plug, as in this one did, very effectively, um, my stripping still. In addition, sulfur plus heavy hydrocarbons equals very corrosive sludge, and that's what you're looking at here. All right, so in terms of how do you deal with this, um, really, filtration is the key. And so, quote from John M. Campbell, Sr., uh, good filtration is critical for satisfactory performance. And so, uh, this, is, this is kind of an extreme example. Um, a, a lot of plants don't have TEG that looks so beautiful like this, all right? Um, but we were doing performance testing and we were testing out these carbon filters. And so, essentially, good filtration really is critical. Um, I would prefer a full flow filtration, all right, because then I know I can capture the maximum amount of particulate or, you know, degradation products or, you know, whatever contaminants I have coming in. But the problem with it is this requires commitment to filter maintenance and change outs, all right. And so a lot of plants have their carbon filters and they've never been changed out. And so how effective is that carbon filter? Not, it's just a wide space on the line. So you have to be maintaining these things. Um, but the good benefit is that they will remove my heavy hydrocarbons, my uh, degradation products, and if I'm using them, antifoam. So you gotta be aware of that. Um, in addition, uh, it will definitely help mitigate my TEG foaming, plugging, and corrosion issues. So basically, if I can keep my TEG clean, all right, if I can keep my TEG clean, and I'm maintaining all of my other key performance parameters, I can be ensured that I'm always meeting my dry gas dew point specification, all right? And so uh, at any rate, um, the last thing that I have here is a Kahoot quiz that I would like to play before we take questions, all right? So I, I believe, hey Clay, how are we doing on time? Will we have time for questions after this quiz? Uh, yep, we sure do. Uh, we'll run over the hour, but as long we'll stay on as long as people want to stay on. So, uh, yep, that's no problem. We we do have quite a few questions, Kendra, well, and uh, some some really good ones in there. Okay. And so just to help for you. Sweet. I haven't been. I've been uh, trying to be the time master over here, so I, I haven't been following the chat. So I apologize. All right, good deal. So here's the thing: we're going to play a game. Now, I don't know how many people are still online. But I think we can only get maybe 100 people logged in, all right? And it's a really fun quiz, um, so I hope that you guys try it out. And so basically, this is the Kahoot cheat sheet here, all right? So get out your cell phone, all right? You can play on your phone. If you're sitting at your computer, you can play it on your computer. But what you want to do is go to kahoot.it, all right? And you can do it in your phone browser or your computer browser. And then look at my presentation for the game PIN number. Put that into, type the PIN into your phone. Uh, you can use your name, you can use nickname. Um, and then watch my screen for the quiz questions and then answer the questions by using your phone. I have um, a couple of questions where there's multiple correct answers. So when you do that, you have to remember to hit submit or it doesn't, it won't correlate, all right? It's timed and you get points. All right, so be quick because your time is limited. All right. All righty, so here we go.
All right. Oh. All right, here we go. All right. Nice job, guys. All right. So here, the question was, select the correct answer. Dry gas pipelines should be payable. All right. That's the most cost-effective way to ensure that I can manage any corrosion in my system so that I can run a pig down the line and ensure that I'm sweeping out any type of fluids that could have built up. Um, as far as constructing, you know, high alloy steels, I, we just we can't afford that. In addition, um, chemical injection like corrosion inhibitor and biocides are very expensive. And so we always want to try to minimize um, the use of those if we can, if possible. All right, good work. And Andy is in the lead, followed by Ted. All right, this one you need to press submit. Nice job, guys. All right, so remember, my pipeline water specifications are driven by my safety, right? Pipeline safety, that's critical, and my local ambient conditions. Um, in addition, they're also specified by the pipeline company in the tariff agreements. So whoever owns that pipeline will set what their tariff agreement is, and that will tell you what your specification is that you need to meet. All right, and Forrest is now in the lead, followed by Gigi. All right, excellent work. The primary purpose of that lean rich gas exchanger is to reduce the heat duty required in the regenerator. All right, now here's the thing. If you think about that lean rich exchanger and you think about that picture that you saw in my slide presentation and it's heav heavily fouled, um, you know that that's going to push more load over into your reboiler. And so you kind of need to keep an eye on that and ensure that you know if, if you're starting to get a lot of fouling in that system uh, to clean it out. So just something to be aware of. It could affect your reboiler operation. All right, Forrest is in the lead. Uh, he's also on fire with three correct in a row. BK is now in second place. All right, beautiful job, guys. Maximum temperature limit. This is in the bath. Um, 400 Fahrenheit or 204 C. All right, good job.
All right, Forrest is maintaining that lead, followed by BK. All right, so the primary purpose of controlling that lean TEG outlet temperature, uh, the cooler outlet temperature, is to prevent condensing out the heavy hydrocarbons from my inlet gas. All right, um, all right, good stuff. CA is now in the lead, followed by BK. All right, ooh, tough question. You guys, here's the deal. Remember, remember, you cannot dry yourself with a wet towel. If that lean TG is not lean enough, you will never meet your dry gas spec, period, never. So that is the most important uh, performance parameter. So you need to understand what is that minimum um, in terms of your operation. All right, Leandro is now in the lead, followed by CA. All right, good stuff. The second limiting factor in my TG unit performance is I need to be sure I have adequate reboiler temperature and stripping gas rates. Um, if I don't, then I know that I don't have the minimum lean TG concentration that I need. All right, good stuff. Leandro is holding on to the lead now, followed by Forrest. All right, nice work. The third key performance parameter is not enough buckets. All right, so if I don't, if I don't have enough buckets to remove the water, um, I'm not gonna meet my dry gas spec. And so that is my lean TG circulation rate. All right, beautiful. Leandro is still in the lead, followed by Forrest. All right, beautiful. Effective inlet separation. You cannot afford the DHI unit if you cannot afford good inlet separation. And essentially what uh, John M. Campbell Sr. was trying to say is that you will spend so much in operating uh, problems and maintenance issues and TEG makeup 
that you would have been better off buying a really good separator to begin with. All right, so effective inlet separation is critical. Leandro is doing a fabulous job um, maintaining the lead, followed by Forrest. All right, interesting. Uh, 61 of you, or 66%, said full flow carbon filtration that is maintained regularly. Uh, from my perspective, that would be my vote. Um, we have 20% at full flow carbon filtration, 13% um, with slipstream that's maintained regularly, and then 1% with just slipstream carbon filtration. All right, good stuff. Last question. All right, beautiful. 83% uh, thought that it was very helpful, good information. That's excellent. 11% uh, of you would like more te technical depth. Um, it's hard to go really deep in only an hour, so that makes it a little tough. Um, but thank you for that feedback. And 6% attended only out of curiosity. So. All right, nice job. Oh. All righty, so good job, you guys. Um, I guess with that said, let me stop this horrific music. Um, I'm happy to stay on the line and ask, uh, answer any questions. Um, just really quickly, um, if you guys found this useful, um, here are some other uh, instructor-led and virtual-led courses that um, we have out there. Uh, G4, which is gas conditioning and processing, um, that's a two-week program. And I will be doing a virtual session in September, and I would love to have you join me. Um, we also do a lot of operator training. And so, you know, the different contexts, but really good, excellent content. In addition, we have other um, online modules available. And lastly, I really want to give everyone a big thank you for spending this hour, well, hour and 15 minutes uh, with us this morning. Um, I know I went really, really fast. There was a lot of stuff that I put in there, but I, you know, I hope you got something out of it. Um, so anyways, if, if you want more information, um, feel, feel free to reach out to Clay. Uh, or contact me directly if you have any technical questions. Um, I'm more than happy to, you know, I, I guarantee you, you will get a response. I promise I'll respond and I'll do the best that I can to help you out. All right, so with that said, um, Stu, Clay, shall we take a question? Hey, uh, so, so uh, nice job, Kendra. Oh. I have, uh, my fingertips have been burning off here <laughs> with all the questions and I, uh, it's a good thing I had a few cups of coffee here this morning because my brain's been getting a workout with some of the questions. So um, the first thing I'll say is that I think we need to extract all of the questions out of, we have questions in chat and then we have questions in Q&A and it's a little bit of a mess. We need to work through all that, put together a PDF so that when we send this out, we can send everybody the list of questions and answers and you and I can go through them. Some of my answers have been very speedy, right? And and the chat's got limitations. You can only post so many letters, right? But I think uh, we can get back to everybody with some, a little bit more thought out questions. I just need to spend an hour going through them all, right? Oh, there are so many questions in here, I have to say, that are really interesting. Um, and I, if we go through all the questions, we're gonna be here until 10 o'clock. 
but um, there's, there's a couple that stand out. And so I'm going to just throw them at you and let you dialogue them. And there's a couple of people that have had interest about pro processing above the phase diagram. So they're in the dense phase region. Okay. And, and I, you know, personally, I haven't had too much experience in that realm, but um, I think about issues with processing in the dense phase region where you've got um, absorption issues and viscosity issues and density issues. And and so maybe you could say a few words about that. Mm. Um, right. So here's here's the thing. Um, I will admit. Well, okay. Let me take a step back. <laughs> um, I, operating in the dense phase region, basically, um, for those of you who who aren't aware, um, if I have a gas and I'm in the dense dense phase, I'm denser. I have a higher density, more you know pounds per cubic foot than a typical natural gas. So, but um, I'm a lot more compressible, so I'm more compressible than a, a liquid, all right? So I, I start having unusual uh, physical properties of the gas as a result of being at such elevated pressure. The only way I can have a dense phase is at very elevated pressure. And so one of the key parameters when I start thinking about mass transfer is I need to be aware of what physical properties I have between the gas and the liquid solvent. And so then, you know, for the issues that Stu was talking about, well, you know, what about viscosity and, and mass transfer coefficients and, and all of this? Um, as far as the actual um, design of the, the contactor itself and whatever mass transfer devices, you'd want to be certainly working with your vendor um, because they'll they'll be able to help you through those. But from my perspective, what my experience has been is once once I start operating at the very high dense phase region of the gas, I'm going to start seeing much higher TEG losses as a result. Because now that gas is so dense, um, I can have uh, some greater mutual solubility with the TEG. And so there was some studies that, um, I don't remember if the data book, the research committee did these or not. We had talked about doing some research on dense phase and TEG dehydration systems. Um, I'll have to go back through the research reports because I remember we had talked about taking a bunch of data to, to really try to figure out what was happening um, in the laboratory so then we knew better how to you know, apply these uh, designs in the field. Um, but I think during, you know, just as general, um, I, I believe that your TEG losses might be greater. Um, certainly you can get it to work, but the internals of that contactor um, will require definite more attention. In addition, I think the other thing I would say, if I'm operating in the dense phase, um, I'd want to be sure that I'm keeping that TEG very clean because I could I could imagine having a much higher propensity to fall. I'm going to cut you off there and go to the next question. Um, a couple of fast fitting, hard hitting numbers um, for you. Minimum contact temperature. And, and when I get into minimum contact temperature with TEG, I start thinking about viscosity and loss of the contact and performance as the viscosity climbs. And so my rule of thumb has always been about 70 degrees air you're going to start hitting issues. Where are you at? Ah, you know what? No one's ever asked me that question. So I'll go with your numbers, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it was New Mexico in the wintertime, and we oh. out in the field of Beehive, we were having issues there. So um, we can definitely do, do a little research, come back on that with our answered questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other the other hard and fast guys, number. For the, SI, for the SI folks, that's 21C. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Flash drum residence time to separate hydrocarbons and TEG. Uh, design your flash drum pretty much as a standard um, liquid separator and to give yourself a little time for skimming oils out of your flash drum. I would aim for a 30 minute residence time. Um, any perspectives, Kendra? Um, that sounds pretty typical. I can go back and, and take a look and see if I have um more guidance on that. Um, 
but you know, really the from my perspective, I'd be more concerned about the placement of that weir and making sure that that weir is not too short. Yeah. For the skim. Having having a good skimming system. Yeah. That you can see what you're skimming out and sample it and yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we had a question here from, uh, I've lost the guy's name, I'm very sorry, Dave. Uh, I've never heard of it, uh, QEG instead of TEG, triethylene versus quadraethylene glycol. Oh, you had a two pound TREG. Yeah, he had a two pound per million specification that he was trying to reach and a 12 tray contactor. So very high spec TEG unit. Right. And um, my experience there is when we had to go to high specifications um, that going with additional stall columns between the surge tank and the regenerator and additional stripping gas. Um, otherwise I was going towards more elaborate things like cold finger to try and condense uh, water out of the regenerator. I don't know if you've got anything that you want to say about those uh, sort of more advanced TEG systems. Oh, um, oh. in, in today's in today's realm, you would very this would be one of the deciding points that would push you towards going towards Molsi. Uh, I mean, that would be my perspective. Well, okay. So here's the deal. Um, just give me a moment. I, I want to pull up a, a diagram of the other options so we can, so folks can appreciate what it is that we're talking about. Um, all right. So from my perspective, the first thing I'm going to say is Dryzo doesn't work. Um, I, I don't think there's been a number of facilities that have installed it, and I haven't heard um, of any fabulous success rates. Um, the other option that does work, I'm sorry, cold finger. I, I apologize. Um, yeah, Dryzo does work. Sorry, does work. Right. Cold finger is not so good. It's a waste of time, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, where is it? Here we go. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of, of the different options. So Dryzol here, what we're doing is we're um, adding a solvent that reduces, we're circulating a, a hydrocarbon solvent that reduces the vapor pressure of water. So I can get it really, really dry. Um, the other option is, which they do on the North Slope, is um, use massive rates of stripping gas. And you can mm -hmm. do that provided that gas is going somewhere. And so on the North Slope op operations, uh, this would be like similar to what ConocoPhillips is doing up there. They need to meet a very, very dry gas spec, all right, because they're going to go into a refrigeration plant. And so, I mean, it's dry. It's way, it's well below two pounds. Um, but the reason why they can do it is because all of that gas is um, recycled and reinjected in the reservoir. And so, if I'm, if I have the capability of doing something with that stripping gas from the still. Um, stripping gas works awesome, but that requires compression, so it becomes expensive. Um, okay. In terms of, of other operations, um, really, I think that's that they don't do cold finger. Cold finger's not good. I I had not come across quad uh, eg. Oh, so here, uh, right. So it is actually tetra. T R E G. Yeah. And the the reason why we use that is because if I'm in a location with a really, really hot climate, it's more effective in regions where let's say I'm in Saudi Arabia or, you know, maybe I'm somewhere in um UAE or you know, in the desert in a desert environment. Um, it has better properties for adsorption at very hot conditions. Um, it has different properties, so it has a higher decomposition temperature, um, and I can get to very uh, low dew points with it. Um, but as a general rule, for typical PEG applications, uh, we do not we do not use that. And so that would be tetraethylene glycol. I, I'm um, assuming that's what they're referring to. Yeah. Uh, the, there was quite a few questions about BTEX, um, and one question I'm just I'm not going to answer it now, but I'll say BTEX on mole sieve. When you do the mole sieve section, 
Um, I hope that you've got some dialogue about BTEX and MOLSIV in your webinar that's coming up. But okay. if, we, if you, I'm not sure if you have anything that you can talk about uh, BTEX and BTEX handling um, on, on TEG systems. Do you have a BTEX condensing system or do you show any of that? Um, no, unfortunately I don't. Um, I, I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. And so um, essentially if you there is an affinity between the TEG and BTEX. And so um, the TEG is going to tend to pull BTEX out of the processing gas. So depending how much BTEX you have coming in, you're going to end up with it concentrating in the regenerator, right? Well, so here, here's what's going on. Um, when I have aromatic compounds, um, remember I have essentially, I, I don't have all my electrons satisfied, so I have double bonds in there, right? And as a result, they have a higher uh, solubility with aqueous fluids versus a more traditional paraffin hydrocarbon that doesn't have any type of electrical car charge. And so as a result, these uh, aromatic compounds will go preferentially, will absorb, not, not necessarily preferentially, but there is much greater solubility than the other hydrocarbons. And so if I have any in my inlet gas stream, I know that I will have a certain amount that is being picked up by either my TEG or my aiming system. And then once it's in there, I need to deal with it because as I mentioned, they're toxic um, and carcinogenic. So um, because they're going to go out the stripping still, that's the only place for them to go. And then once they do exit the still, really the only option is you'll cool off that uh, discharge gas and you'll condense out the water and then you'll burn, you'll send the vapors on to an incinerator. Um, if the BTEX condenses into a liquid phase, you'd also send that to the incinerator. Yeah, unless unless you have a lot of stripping gas there and then you might look at some kind of vapor recovery. Certainly. But yeah, for the most part, we just take that and incinerate it, right? Right. Um, if, if there's the, the, the plant that I showed all those pictures, that was a zero emission facility. And so essentially we were taking all the gas, compressing it back up and putting it in the front end of the plant. So a lot of compression cost associated with that, but yeah, you can do that. Um, okay. Um, right. There are so many questions in here, Kendra. I'm like looking forward to some of your comments and feedback on some of the questions. Well, um, um, we're about 30 minutes over. How many people do we still have? On? Oh my goodness, we still have 106 people online. <laughs> okay. So I don't know. I mean, I, how about we do one more one more question? Um, um, I've been trying to answer them all. There have been a lot of questions about charts and the process, okay. and so. Um, making sure that people are connected with GPSA data book and, and trying to um, connect them with things like hydrate formation charts and the water content charts. And the, uh, if you're trying to troubleshoot a unit in the field, getting your hands on those charts is key. And if you can't get them, you can either email Kindra or myself or uh, they are straight out of GPSA data book though, right? Oh yeah, but well, here's the thing. So um, I'm gonna put on my GPSA membership committee hat now. <laughs> Um, here's the deal. Uh, all GPA midstream and GPSA midstream member companies now have free access to the GPSA engineering data books online. And so those data books will be available online. They're going to be maintained um, online. And so that's one of the huge benefits of being a GPSA or a GPA member. And so if you are a member company and you don't know how to access that, um, I'm on the membership committee, so shoot me a note and I'll send you the quick directions on how to set up your account so you can log in and access those data books. Um, if you don't have, if your company is not a member and you're not interested in becoming a member, that's cool too. You can also buy a hard copy or an, uh, an electronic co copy of the data books. Um, this presentation, um, I believe we're gonna, I, I don't, you have the, the slides from this presentation. Um, and as I mentioned, I'd be happy to send you the SI water content chart. But as far as the rest of the stuff, I kinda, yeah, you know, yeah. 
Um, I got another question for you here. Oxygen in the feed. Uh, yeah. So if you've got any oxygen coming in in your process gas and it's getting into your contactor, uh, what can you expect to happen when that comes in contact with the PEG, uh, uh, either in the contactor or in the regenerator? Uh, very bad things. <laughs> oxygen is bad. Very bad things happen if I send oxygen into my TEG contactor or into my TEG storage tank. And essentially, oxygen really elevates corrosion rates. Um, not only will it increase the corrosion in your system, but it will increase the degradation of your very expensive glycol. And so figure out where that oxygen is coming in from. Um, if you, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, we may be operating a low pressure gathering system. And if we're using reciprocating compressors in those gathering systems and drying that pressure down, uh, you may not have, you may not have a way around getting the oxygen out. Um, I think there's some oxygen scavengers that, that you might want to have a look at, but essentially figure out where it's coming from and stop it because it, that will, result in you needing to make up TEG and have pretty God, maybe even replacing pipes, it's really going to increase your corrosion rate. So keep an eye on your corrosion uh, if you have so, that situation. So one of the one of the problems with um, oxygen in amine systems is that you start creating biocene. Mm -hmm. And that biocene, um, you know, in an amine system you form this iron carbamate or, or iron sulfide that ends up being a protective layer on the inside of the pipe, right? And so then when you have that biocene that becomes present, then that uh, degrades that, that protection layer or, or self-protecting layer. Do you get uh, anything similar, do you think, with uh, TEG where you get uh, not just direct oxidation and, and oxidation of, of piping and so forth, but, but these sort of secondary corrosion mechanisms? Um. I'm not sure I'm the person to answer that. I'm not yeah, the chemist, not, right? We, we could ask Hub. We could ask Bob Hubbard. Um, yeah, uh, Carlos Blasios was the oh other yeah, guy. Carlos would be excellent yeah. feedback, yeah. We'll send that I, question to them. I'm really not sure, like, with the actual chemistry. All I know is that it's going to start eating your solvent and increase your yeah. production rates. So, yeah. And, yeah, and so the best thing that you could be doing there is, and, and I mean, we we used to have shutdown valves on, uh, a number of producers with oxygen sensors set up at 10 ppm that would slam shut producing wells if they uh, um, had higher oxygen coming from a certain group of wells. And so 10 ppm was the limit that we set on our producers in the field to just block them in if, if they couldn't keep the oxygen out. That was just what we did on that location. Well, certainly, and that's the other thing that you need to be cognizant of is that, um, especially in North America, we're so um, intermixed, right? And so I might be paying someone to take my molecules from my well pad, right? And so that pipeline will have a tariff or, you know, could have some potential oxygen limit if, let's say, I own the pipeline, and it's my gathering system. Um, then I need to start making the decision, am I going to do something about, you know, blocking in these wells or changing, you know, how I'm taking the production in to reduce that oxygen content, or am I going to live with it in my facility and just keep a really close eye on my oxygen? And so really, you know, everything depends because you don't know if you own that part of the pipe or the process or, you know, maybe I'm going to pay someone else to go do the TEG dehydration for me, right? And then they might say, look, I'm not going to take your gas because you have too much oxygen in it. So it yeah. really, I mean, it really just depends. Um, causes of foaming. Huh. Okay. I, I said um, hydrocarbons and particulates in the solution. Mm -hmm. um, it, it tends to be predominant. Obviously, high rates in the contactor, you are more pr predominant to foam. Uh, but basically checking filtration and check the performance of your carbon bed through some lab sampling and testing. Um, keeping the solution clean is obviously uh, a key thing here. Right. Anything else that you would want to add to that? Well, yeah, so certainly. So for example, um, uh, let's say we just had some well workovers and now I'm getting some additional drilling fluids or some such coming into the plant. Um, 
maybe let's say I have a gathering system and I have CO2 in my gas and we just decided to, hey, let's try out a new corrosion inhibitor in the wet gathering system. And now that corrosion inhibitor comes into my TEG unit and guess what, it blows it up. Um, so it really, I mean, there's any foreign chemical that I'm using in my plant, uh, in, in my field operation somewhere else that can end up into that TEG unit can start causing foaming. Lube oil, I mean, compressor lube oil is another brilliant one, right? You know, you get a little bit of lube oil in there, boy, you're gonna have a big mess on your hands. Um, anything that's a surfactant, um, the horrific pictures that you saw, you don't put soap in your, be careful when you clean your, do uh, chemical cleaning, right? Um, but um, uh, organic sulfur compounds can really aggravate foaming. The pictures that you saw here, insane. It was, um, it, it was a, a weird, in like gas composition, but we had a lot of organic sulfur compounds and that's what was causing uh, all of the havoc inside the plant. Um, so organic sulfur compounds. Um, the other things, you know, if, I, if I'm doing some kind of, you know, anti-foam, um, in some places you may, if your foaming is bad enough, you may choose to try to use the anti-foam, then, you know, you need to do a test figure out which chemical is going to work. But the problem with that is you put in too much anti-foam that you're just going to make your problem worse. Um, so a myriad of things, pretty much <laughs> anything but TG will make it foam. And, it, and I, think, I think about, you know, the whole like cleaning part of the system and, and filtration and carbon. And, and um, it's very difficult to know when your carbon bed is done. And um, there was, there's been a couple of questions in here about carbon and, and exceeding the design rate or, you know, should I be full stream or slip stream with my carbon? And, you know, carbon requires a certain resonance time. And so there's going to be, depending on the size of the vessel, there's going to be a design rate. Um, and so you need to find out what that design rate is and not, not go over the top of it. But, well, certainly. And, well, and also you need to be really careful with those particulate filters because you can blow them out. Yep. Um, and then, then you have a bigger problem. Yep. Um, so at any rate, the, really the best way to know it is take samples of your TEG. Be looking at it. Um, run laboratory analysis on it and, yep. um, and see what you have in there. And so not just the standard. So uh, when I look at my TEG sampling, we have yeah. some uh, papers on it, but Basically, I, I want to know what contaminants are in there. I can do that type of analysis. My chemical supplier, if I don't have a laboratory at my plant with the capabilities of doing this, I can work with my chemical supplier. They will take it and they'll run the test for me. Um, so that's, that's the best way. The, the way that you know is, well, is your plant starting to foam? Are you starting to see it in your contactor operations? Um, what color is it? You know, more often than not, it's black. It looks like lube oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it can be, it can change pretty quickly. You know, if, if you have an amine system upstream and you carry some amine over into your TEG system, um, then you can pretty radically change the performance of what's going on in your TEG system uh, just from a, a, a very short period of time, a simple burp over from an upstream system. So. You know, you require this kind of daily trending if you're fighting a lot of problems. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of amine in TEG, um, the, the one there that, that stands out to me is um, the degradation temperature of amine is below the operating temperature in the regenerator. And so if you do end up with amine in your TEG, then you're going to end up with some pretty nasty stuff forming inside the regenerator. Right. Well, I think, you know, honestly, if you, if you don't have adequate carbon infiltration maintenance at that point, you're gonna have to start blowing down and replacing TIG. Yep. I mean, there's really no other way to get out of the system. Yep. Once yeah. it's there, it's there. Yeah. So, and it's interesting, there was a couple of other questions that, you know, there was, um, there's a gentleman here with a, a facility which is directly upstream of a uh, dew point plant. And so uh, they're going straight into a brace aluminum heat exchanger downstream of their TEG unit. And, and so, I mean, oh, what it sounds like. Oh, so, wait, whoa. What kind of temperatures are they running through that 
Dew point, dew point temperatures. I, I don't have those details, Kendra. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but if you think about what TEG's going to do when you start getting it cold, it's going to start to um, become more viscous. It's going to start to plate out on any kind of heat exchanger. And so uh, be really nervous about getting too cold downstream because you will, you will always have some carryover in a mid phase from your contactor well, uh, that downstream cooling equipment. Really from, uh, if that was my plan, I put in a filter coalescer upstream in the cold section. Because here's the thing, I, even, even before that um, TEG starts getting, you know, really cold, it can start filming out on the brace aluminum heat exchanger, and now you've completely fouled your heat exchanger and you lose your thermal performance. Yeah. And so it's not even just a matter of plugging because now I got, you know, a viscous chunk of, uh, or a frozen chunk of TEG stuck in there. But it's also a matter of, of fouling that brace aluminum heat exchanger, and those things you're not really going to be able to effectively clean, in my mind, anyways. I mean, you can do some chemical cleaning, but I, you know, um, I that in the first place. <laughs> can you can you give us a good uh, rule of thumb for the um, reflux? coil on the top of the steel column on the regenerator uh, in terms of what the outlet temperature should be. I want to say that Frank was talking to us about this yesterday. Yeah, he was saying 110. Um, so just give me a moment. And, um, um, I, I want to say it was the, uh, that's the miles, that was in uh, 110 to 115, somewhere around there. That's in C. So call it. I've, 200 and so here, here's the deal. All right, here's the deal. If I'm not using stripping gas, I can run it warmer. All right, so no stripping gas. I should be, say, 225 to 235 Fahrenheit. And I should expect to have pretty minimal TEG losses. If it's hotter than that with no stripping gas, then I know that I'm going to have excess TEG losses going out the still. If I'm using, um, say, 1.3 scuffs per gallon, then maybe I want it to be 215 to 200. Um, I can put, I'll put, we'll, we can put in the the still chart into the notes. I'm looking at a, a nomograph that we use for estimating TEG losses from stripping stills. Uh, for acid gas injection projects into high pressure reservoirs, what yeah. should be the uh, dehydration spec? Oh, well, here's the deal. Now that's an even more complicated question. Um, and the reason why is because um, acid gases have a very unusual saturated water uh, content phase behavior, all right? Mm -hmm. And so that acid gas stream will go through a minimum and then it shoots up through a maximum. So essentially once you hit that minimum and then you keep on compressing the gas, now that gas can hold huge amounts of water. And so, you know, some people say, well, yeah, that looks great. I'm going to design my compression train to knock out the water so I don't need to put the TEG high in. All right. And so folks have tried that with some success. Some folks have had a horrible failure because they miss looking at how am I going to get that compression train started up? And then they started hydrating off or, or you know, having water dropping out where they couldn't manage. So um, in terms of a, a specific uh, acid gas injection, it really depends on what kind of pressures you're trying to get up to and achieve. It also depends on what type of compression you're putting in and what inner stages you have available to you. And so then once you understand that, you understand your gas composition, you can look at, okay, well, where is my danger zone in terms of um, you know, water dropping out being present as a liquid phase, and where do I want to put that TEG high unit within the compression train to ensure that never happens? So it's uh, it's not just a rule of thumb because it depends on a lot of different a lot of different factors of um, of that gas. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we're approaching the end of the end of the line in terms of time. We've still got seventy people on the call here, but a question for you is over circulation. And so if you start thinking about 
too much TEG in circulation that the first thing that we usually go to is excess heat load um, because you're doing so much extra work on the reboiler. But there are definitely other issues. Um, do you want to comment on that one, Kendra? Uh, yeah, so here's the deal. Um, Over-circulating isn't necessarily bad, right? I know that I'm increasing my operating costs because now my reboiler you know, duties may be higher, right? As a result of sending so much THG around in a circle. Um, really the bigger issue is, and uh, I know it sounds kind of weird, I was gonna pull up the chart, but I don't have it in this presentation, but our BTEX absorption, how much BTEX I absorb is a function of that circulation rate. Yeah. The higher the circulation rate, the more BTEX I'm going to be absorbing, the more BTEX I have coming out of my stripper. And so um, that's one of the reasons why you see our modern day plant designs going to taller contactors and lower circulation rates is because by doing that, I'm now minimizing the amount of BTEX that my glycol unit is gonna be picking up. Yeah, and you know, what was going through my head as you answered this is uh, when you go through the process of air permitting, uh, the circulation rate is a key factor in the air permit. Mm. Well, you should be conservative in what that is and try to run below it. Yeah. Right? I mean, figure out what you think your worst case is going to be. Um, oh my gosh, there is, there's still, um, I am sure that we haven't got everyone's question, so. Um, so hey, Stu, uh, I've been compiling the questions from both the Q&A and the chat. Um, like you, you mentioned, we are running up against it here one and three quarter hours, <laughs> but that's that's good. That's a good problem to have. We will uh, we will try to cover as much as we possibly can um, as far as the questions go. Uh, write them up. Uh, answer them, and then we'll go ahead and send them out uh, along with the recording. Um, yeah. So anything that we didn't get to in this session, we will certainly try to address. And again, uh, I'll send this to everybody along with uh, my contact info. And so if if, if there's other stuff um, that that you'd like to address, we'll certainly try to do that. Um, Hey, thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Stu, uh, for wrangling all the questions. No worries. Um, thanks to everyone still on the call. We really appreciate it. And again, uh, in a few weeks, Kendra will be doing uh, the second DHI session uh, on molecular sieves, uh, and I'll send out a link to register for that along with all of the other materials. So uh, have a great rest of your mornings, evenings, uh, nights, and uh, we hope to talk to you again soon. Yep, thank you everyone. Yeah, yeah I think I just put a, a few thanks in there to the people asking the questions. Uh, there's been some super questions in here. Natin, uh, Moriaz, Waled, um, you guys have been pushing out some super questions and I, I hope that we're answering them for you well. Um, but I really appreciate that dialogue because I promise you the questions that you guys are asking, other people are going, hey, thanks for asking that question. So thanks. Absolutely. All right, thanks all, take care everybody. All right, thank you. Thanks Bye. all, bye.